Um, with that said, I'd like to uh, turn things over to our session chair for this afternoon, Sal Sethi. Okay, welcome everybody to the celebration of Jeff. And our first speaker is Jeff's thesis advisor. Now, somebody who really doesn't require any introduction in the string theory community. Uh, Pierre Ramon is coming to us from the University of Florida, where he's the distinguished professor of physics, and he is one of the initiators of super string theory. I'm sure you'll have lots of fun stories for us about Jeff. <laughs> ah. Well, thank you. Thank you for giving me the occasion to, to, to celebrate Jeff, and at the same time, remind myself of all these wonderful years that we spent together. The wonderful physics that was initiated there and, and uh, the good experience in general. So, now I am. So, presumably, if you press this button, it's a laser, right? So, if you press a button. Yeah. If, if speakers want to take off their masks so that everybody can hear, that should be fine. Yeah, <laughs> so, just, just, I think you, you'll need to advance uh, using the laptop, but the, but the button, middle button is a pointer. Okay, the pointer works. That's okay, so thank you. Yeah, I will advance it here. As the time comes, I don't have many things to say, so I will spend a lot of time on this. <laughs> so, this is part of a, um, a Hollywood display for a very famous movie, and um, but it is very nice. I mean, it's uh, it just. Um, you will see later, later on, I will make many, very few references to that, but I will make a few. So this is Jeff at 66 plus or minus one, I'm not sure. <laughs> and uh, the, many years ago, I think when, when uh, people were um, feeding uh, Gelman's such birthday, Telegdi said, we're not here to celebrate Murray's uh, birthday, we're here to celebrate his conception. So, so that. <laughs> I know nothing about it. No, I don't. You're, you're smart, but you're not that smart. Okay, well, okay. So, I will talk about various things. So, this, I didn't mean to split, but it is split. Okay, so at, at Yale, where I was coming from, Fisa Gursé uh, had convinced me that exceptional groups were so beautiful and so unique that they had to be used by nature. Nature could not possibly not use them. And when Jeff uh, started, oh, go ahead. No, no, please go ahead. You know, look for an advisor. A lot of the, ooh, and then take away the, uh, the thumb thing. Oh. Ooh. <laughs> okay. All right. So when uh, Jeff searched for, for an advisor, I, I suggested he look at these groups, uh, mostly because of a very important fact. As we were doing uh, quantum field theory, these groups do, do not have quartic invariants. Therefore, their potentials, their renormalizable potential is a greater symmetry. And uh, basically, they had to be broken, etc. And he said, oh, yeah, OK. All right. And then, I don't know, maybe two, three days later, something like that, he came back with a full analysis of it. And, uh, you know, and I knew that this was an exceptional, exceptional student. And uh, I, was, I was very, very, very pleased. And also, this is what Feynman called genetic improvement, called genetic improvement. I had only stopped at E6, but as you know, later went on to E8 cross C8, okay? Which is, in number and quality, is definitely an a <laughs> genetic improvement. And, uh, and to, the, to this day, uh, this, these groups have been put on the map. Uh, we're not sure it's the map of our universe, but it's a map, it's on the map. Okay, and maybe it will be at some point. So, now, so my, um, there were two, I wasn't supposed to have graduate students at that time, I was, but uh, uh, 
I was basically Jeff came on and another student called David Ruiz and uh, decided I was kind of at a loss to give him a, a, a problem. But these were the days of Gwen Unified Theories, the days of SU5, et cetera, et cetera, that kind of stuff. And I, I, was, I was actually taking a Feynman's course on quantum field theory at some point. And I remember him using often the term of Farragut, I guess, damn the torpedoes, which meant that if, we, if you're not sure what, what to do, just calculate it and see what happens. And then if it's really interesting, you will go back to it. And that is the philosophy that we have used. And we have used into what I call complete, it's not a misspelling, uh, SO10 Gwen Unified model, which contained almost everything you wanted. You had CP violation, neutrino masses, because of what the, of the recently formulated CISO mechanism, all the way from electric to Planck scale. And then the idea was let's not worry too much about the ugly stuff, which is, of course, the Higgs uh, sector, which to this day nobody really believes, but nevertheless, it does seem to give <laughs> very beautiful very beautiful results. Okay. Oops, what? Oh, I, I have to. Yeah, I can do that. Oh, wow. Ah, okay. So, what was the content of this model? Okay. So, this model had basically this is a model for Yukawa couplings, the standard model. Remember, you, string theorists don't like Yukawa couplings. I mean, usually they stop at, at Yukawa couplings, but they are there. And in our, in our case, uh, in this case, it was a symmetric, namely that uh, the, uh, the matrices were symmetric. Okay, and I'm, I will not uh, I will not bore you with the details of this paper. I'll bore you later with another paper. But uh, but I want to come to the iconoclastic conclusion. At the time, we thought we were very daring, and basically we thought the top part was about thirty GV, which was pretty daring for the time. Okay, then this minus three here has to do with what's known as the Georgi Yaskov construction based on SU5, which seemed to give a lot of very nice relations for relating the mass, the, the, the down quarks to the charged leptons. And so we, it was so nice, we were able to improve it to use the symmetry of. Uh, of uh, SO10, the symmetries of SO10. So that was one thing. But the most important thing we did, in a certain sense, without knowing it was important, was that the B quark in this model, its, its, its lifetime was proportional to the mass of the top. And therefore, it was far longer lived than people had expected. And now, as you know, in experiments, especially in, in, at that time, everybody expected there was some, some school of thought at some point, and it will be very, very short lived, but it's long lived, and now it's a main tool of, for at, at colliders. And this was something we, I don't think we ever got any, any, any recognition, recognition for that, but to be fair, I'm not sure we understood the, the, the physical implications. Now, the second thing, of course, or the, the third thing, was the neutrino masses via the CISO. Now, the CISO had just been formulated in the context of SO10, okay? And what we found, that the quark and neutrino mixings were very, very different. Again, against all expectations from the sociology of the time, okay? And in particular, we even found that one of the white and neutrino um, mixing was, was, was large. So following this, this thing, damn the torpedo stuff, we, we stumbled onto some patterns which actually seem to have been realized later on. Maybe not because of this model, but before, because the fact that perhaps SO10 is a lot smarter than we thought. So I just wanted to do this. So, okay, so now what do I do? I, should, I return? Just, just scroll up. Just scroll up. No. No. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll click on the page though. You're I should have done. Yeah, you just I was using the finger on the on the track. Oh, you were using the finger. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Huh? Please don't use now you're too far. <laughs> okay, so now let me remind you about and, and as you can see I'm 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 obsessed with 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 these things because 
the neutrinos and everything is where basically the unexplained data of the standard model is. Okay? And the question is that people should really try as much as possible, even though there's some repetition. So let me first tell you the, the one thing that is most interesting is that the mixing angle, this is, this is almost about, you know, about uh, of, of neutrinos, is made up of two, two things. One having to do with the diagonalization of the charge lepton Yukawa matrix, which is purely an electroweak thing. And another one, which we call UC, so which is basically coming from the near diagonalization of a six by six Majorana matrix. And that, that basically mostly has the gray, is a mixture of, of electroweak, but also has a big unknown component of, of physics beyond the standard model. To this day, we don't know whether that's true. But the most, the, the most in, so therefore this, this thing here, which is being measured with more and more accuracy, although with a long time line, basically gives you an overlap between the physics we know and some physics that we don't know. And in a certain sense, the neutrinos are a way of looking at that. Now, they, an experimentalist, Perkins, uh, after realizing that there were two large neutrino mixing angles, okay? which means this stood in this, remember the quarks. So neutrinos and quarks have the same gauge interactions, blah, 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 almost, certainly electroweak. But of course, there are not two large neutrino angles. And from my point of view, that's the, that's the most important thing to try. He's try, trying to tell us something, except we're not very smart to find out exactly what the something is. But to me, that's very important. And uh, Perkins and his friends uh, came with this geometrical uh, thing here, okay, which is full of stuff we should like here, this audience would like it. It's full of square root of two over three, <laughs> square root of twos, <laughs> etc. Some some clean stuff. <laughs> All right. And uh, somehow, you know, this is what it is. So the, this is the Potekova Makina Kagawa stuff, and this is what it looks like. Okay. And this is this is the way. This was seemed at the time like a good approximation, which actually uh, was close to the data, because the data at that time, the large angles, was one from, from atmospheric, one from solar, okay? And they were very much in agreement. I mean, this was very, very close. And okay. so for my, having been a follower of Dirac all my life, was that this was what I would call a hint of simplicity and beauty. It may not be true, but I will take it as credence a screen that maybe when I was studying chemistry, God forbid, uh, <laughs> and, and large, large angles, okay, then the large angles usually had to do with crystal faces and stuff like that, okay? But God knows what that is. So, but it sounds, there is something interesting about that. But this, this thing uh, of, of Perkins and company thought that the, the, thir the, the third rea reactor the third angle, which is called the reactor angle, was not measured at that point, although there were hints by a reactor called Shaw um, on the northern tip of France. Uh, and uh, it, but it got much better measured by in, uh, in, in China and, and then Korea. And basically, it's like about two thirds of the Kepiro angle. So it ends here. Okay, so therefore, from the point going back to the point of view of the the mixing matrix, is that I want to keep those two angles like that, and therefore I have to explain the value of this angle in terms of what I would call u minus one served as some sort of a Kabibo Haynes coming from the electroweak sector to correct these things. Okay, so those, those this is the basic thing. So let me give you an example. This I'll go very quickly. This is a, a generic uh, model we, which we made up, and I'm, I'm not going to say very much about it because, I, uh, but it's a generic, what I call joint symmetric texture. So a symmetric texture starts with lambda is as a Wolfenstein, I use Wolfenstein parameters for those of you who don't know it, it's just these ways to parameterize the CKM matrix introduced by Lincoln. And uh, so the one minus one, one, one minus, it's all symmetric. This is one means it's proportional to, obviously. And, but the SU5 symmetric texture uh, 
had a very interesting relation is that this u minus one was proportional to u of ckm and the, the quark mixing matrix with only one change that the c here was a change into minus three which came from a cleft gordon coefficient of su5 okay which is and it was it was wonderful and what that stuff gave was incredible stuff m tau is equal to mb we said that's dumb no it's not dumb at the grand unified scale because you you renormalize factors factors of three logarithms can sometimes provide factors of three okay <coughs> then, then you have other things like this and that mu and me in particular the determinant of this charge minus one third determinant of minus one are at the go, at a gut scale, whatever that is, it's probably the same. Okay, and those are just numerical parameters which you don't need to know about it, but it satisfies everything. Okay, and then in, in this model, you assume I'll go very quickly the PMNS as TBN in here, tried by maximal, the Perkins thing. Okay, and you extract the third mixing area. What do you find? You compute it, and it's about one third of the experimental value. So, therefore, that doesn't work. Okay, so that that you so symmetric text will process you five plus TBM. Okay. Now I consulted my old friend Graham Ross, a texture enthusiast, if there ever was one. Basically, is there any reason to go in, into a, a texture that is not symmetric? Because after all, we don't know whether it should be symmetric. Those are theoretical predictions. So I'm going to go down the rabbit hole without a rabbit. <laughs> this rabbit did not contribute to this paper. <laughs> All right, but the shadow was there. Uh, and I, again, I used down the torpedoes to formulate a model with an asymmetric. Okay. And they, what, so by down the torpedoes, I mean, ignore the fine tuning. There's going to be tremendous fine tuning. But I'm going to, to try to find a texture where all these nice relations are true. Okay? And then I will see what happens. Okay? So, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a phenomenologist. You may know me. I mean, I'm doing exact science, but this is not exact science. It turns out, much to our surprise, that you can work something like that. Those are the three Yukawa matrices. It is asymmetric. You see this, this D parameter here. And you see, you see, this is a lambda lambda cube that's definitely asymmetric. The y minus one has a Georgie Yaskok stuff because the c in a 2 2 position here is minus 3c in there, etc. All everything works in this stuff, okay? And then, so you say, aha, let me compute the reactor angle. The reactor angle, I compute blah blah blah. Guess what? It's bigger than the experimental value. <laughs> Shocks. Okay. Right? I told you this is phenomenal. <laughs> so, what we do, we do something out of desperation. We said we're going to add a CP violating phase to the model. After all, nature has CP violation. And so, we're going to change the, the, the Perkins matrix. To have an angle, we'll do it this way, simple stuff, and then we calculate. Okay, so we calculate it, and we find that the, the, the mathematical value, as this angle appears here, and this is an absolute value. And what happens? We find that for cosine down, this angle being cosine point two. Okay, all right. That, by the way, we don't. That means we don't know the sign. Okay. All right. Basically. We fix it at the experimental value, which you call, by the way, PDG, in case some people, you know, <laughs> it's not PDF, it's PDG. Okay, all right. And therefore, let, let us see what happens. So now we have to put the, the results in PDG language. And to our surprise, this is what happens. What, what we find is that we translate the delta before in the, in the particle data group conventions, we find it's plus or minus, because I told you, we cannot tell you the sign, is 1.32 pi, compared with the best global fit right now. Nobody has definitely measured this, but by assuming the unitarity of the three by three matrix and the different values of the angles, people surmise that there is 
a CP violation. So the CP violation, you see, is why this is very close up to a sign. And then the, the same thing, if you look at the other angles, the atmospheric or the solar, okay, you see that there one is about 60, half a degree below PDG, this one is one degree above PDG. So from my point of view, even though there was an exercise like damn the torpedoes, we should pay attention to this. Okay, and now comes the part that is completely boring. And, uh, if you want to take five minute break, please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, all right. So, so what we do is this, okay? So we basically have this weird stuff, okay? And, and we have all these relations working. And at the same time, if the, if the experimentalist, uh, I don't know if Dune is gonna do it, but, but basically the hyper K, People like that are going to measure these things at some point. Okay. Uh, basically, what happens is that we make a model with some family symmetry. The characteristics are all the Yukawa couplings are high dimensions. That means that at the tree level, there are no Yukawa couplings. The chiral matter, matter in SU5 is 5 bar per 10, vector like messengers to generate this thing. We have to add a bunch of fields called familons which are scalar fields with only family symmetry, okay? And then what we want, we want, remember, we have to single out, for example, uh, a particular term in a matrix element, okay? We have to be careful because, you see, with a symmetric or anti-symmetric matrix, that's easy because group theory can do it for you easily. But if it is asymmetric, you have to be more clever. It's a little bit more complicated. So we have to look for a group which has basically a little bit more pizzazz in it. Yes, right. And uh, we also have, by, by, by the way, it turns out we have a wonderful mechanism of the vanishing of the subdeterminant in a combination of dimension five and dimension six operators. I will not bore you with that. That that, that works well. Okay. The family symmetry is this thing. It's a it's a so-called for, forbidden thing. Forbidden <laughs> t. So it's a z13 semi-direct product with z. C3, by the way, it has something interesting because it is a maximal subgroup of a modular group, which is itself a maximal, uh, one of the maximal subgroups of continuous G2, which coming from exceptional groups, and Fezaglo says, elixir in my body. That sounds, <laughs> that sounds a little bit, okay. Its representations are these, you don't have to know that. And now what happens in order to make it work, the chiral model in SU5 have to be split up into a triplet of one type and a triplet on the other type. The Higgs field, because of, jo of Georgi Yask Yaskov is five and 45. They are vector-like messengers. I won't give you the details because that's not, not particularly interesting. There are a bunch. So, okay, and now what is very interesting in this model is the following is that they are, the, they are a bunch of familons, okay? Oh, this is a new string, sorry, this is a three one. And, but the question is that in order to make it work, all the familon expectation values, your triplets, they are, you, do, you don't see a 0.5, a 0.2, a 0.3, it's all geometrical like. We don't know the, the proportionality constant, but all the patterns are reproduced by something relatively clean, but we don't know what, what that means, okay? All right. So let us go on now to the, to the sterile neutrinos, okay? So how do we introduce, now I'll go to, to, to the CISO, and I'm gonna use some group theory, which I think you know by now. So SO10, SU5 cross U1, the 16 is a spin. Oh, by the way, in, uh, in this paper, Harvey, uh, R, H, R, R, A, H, R, Reese, okay? There's a beautiful appendix that somebody whose name starts with an H wrote um, on this basically spinners, in, uh, which is very, very good. If you want to read about it, this is the most, it's, it's very elegant. Now, so there it is, five bar plus n plus one. This 10 here, that's a vector representation, not to be confused. Oh, not again. Okay, vector like mass, okay, blah, blah, blah. So what happens here, you see that there's a five bar here and there's a five here. Okay, so if you take, you could have a vector-like mass between this five bar and this five, take them out of the stuff, okay? And then you are left 
naturally with two representations, a 10 n and five, five bar in different representation of the group. Okay, and then and then you have there it is, three right-handed neutrinos coming out as you upgrade from SU, SU5 to SU10. Okay, all right, boom, boom, boom. And now, now, now you can start talking. So the first thing you look at are the three right-handed neutrino masses, and you have to ask the fam family on. Okay, and again, the, if the family on vacuum is one minus one, one, which actually comes up when you look at, um, at, at potentials, uh, and you look at minimum value of potential, it's very, very natural, except they call minus one e to the i pi. When you find out a big interesting result is that the Majorana mass is actually diagonalized by TBM. In other words, the relationship of the Kleffgorian coefficient of this group with a simple, in simple direction gives you TBM, and this, this is the result of this, the seesaw thing. Okay. So that's another indication that there is something interesting that comes up, except, except that it doesn't work. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm going, look, I'm, I'm very tenacious. <laughs> so this is, this is the, the CISO. Now for the CISO, you need the Dirac, you need this, etc. And, and you continue your analysis, etc., etc. Okay. Then you have to put this Dirac mass from another. And then you find out very easily that S now is A squared over M. So this, this is the, the proportionality constants. Okay, TBM, but these are the masses you see, and right away you know something is wrong, because okay, that means those are the masses of the of the left-handed neutrinos. Okay, but according to this, there will be no no oscillation between new one and new three because they will have the same mass, and you know that 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 is completely wrong. So this doesn't work. And now you say, but could could there be any more? right under neutrinos. And you say, okay, all right, Ramon, take it easy. It's gonna be all right, okay. <laughs> but, but I have something, hold on a second. But guess what? If you go from SO10 to E6, you get one extra right under neutrino. Now, it doesn't mean it's right. But what happens is, oops. Okay, what is this? So I'm going from just I'm going from SU5 to SO10, you get okay, but in E6 to SO10, as you probably now know from, from it's probably ingrained in the frontal lobes of everybody, 27 is 16 plus 10 plus 1. This guy here is there, and remember the SO10 content that we had is a 16 on a 32 and a 10 on a 31. Well, the the PSL 213 group and the the T13 group has a singlet, complex singlet representation. So it doesn't take uh, much to assume that perhaps the chiral content of the theory will be 16.32 plus 10 to the <coughs> plus 1, 1 prime, and that will be the fourth right handed neutral. So therefore, this, this, uh, this uh, kind of game has gotten us to this particular thing, okay? And, and then the, P the PSL 213, of course, which, on which T13 is the maximum subgroup, has a representation which is complex in this case, 3, 1 plus 3, 2 plus 1 prime. Okay, E6 has this representation, and this looks like a marrying of both of them. And I don't understand where that's coming from, but that's what we're being led to. Okay, and interestingly enough, in this case, we even get the masses of the, of the neutrinos. This is merely electron volts, of course, and it is the normal hierarchy, what people call the normal. So, now this, this is, of course, model building gone crazy, okay? But it turns out that fundamentally, and you, uh, I'm almost finished. Uh, okay, it turns out that there's another simpler version of this, which we came across recently, of, of, of the same uh, anti-symmetric texture, which is this, this, uh, this, uh, this group, T13 can be replaced with T7 with the same kind of thing, okay? And this is below the rabbit hole. If you go to a rabbit hole, usually that's where the rabbit keeps his wine. <laughs> so, 
Uh, now, the interesting stuff, again, is that this group of PSL213, okay, they're a modular group, obviously, as the name indicates. At the same time, they're finite subgroups of G2. They both have seven-dimensional representations. And to a good theorist, seven-dimensional representation maybe smells a bit like M-theory or something like that. I don't know. Okay? So, anyway, so at the end of the day, this leaves me, and you probably, okay, with a very funny feeling. So we go back to Octonians. We maybe, and then of course, I was I was looking at Jeff's latest paper, Moonshine, and uh, and the question is that maybe all of that is, is 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 related. But what I wanted to say is that this long path, okay, which we started together, okay, leads you to look at an explanation of this, and it leads you to very interesting group theory, which may or may not be realized. We don't know. Okay, it's up to you. And then of course. A normal person would be, you know, screaming. So I'm almost finished. I should tell you one more one more thing about this rabbit. Okay, this this rabbit. Uh, there, there was there's, there's one paper I did not mention here. Okay, and it's and it's a H H H paper. H for Harvey. H for Hill. H for Hill. That's a beautiful paper of the knowledge of theory meeting experiment. Okay? If you look at the West Zemino Witten part of the standard model, you get an extra interaction, which with the mass of some, some boson is, is of the right order of magnitude, can be a source of extra neutrinos. Okay? And that, that is an example where you marry very interesting theory, very, very fundamental theory to possible interesting data. I am told the experimentalists don't believe a word of it, which is a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't ruled it out, though. Huh? They haven't ruled it out. No, of course not. They can't. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so let me, let me leave you with, with something here about neutrino technology. <laughs> so I come, you may be kind of impatient, but <laughs> In the, uh, in, in the world of, of strings, etc., you know, in 1975, my friend Lars Brink told me, we don't need experiment anymore. Uh, 1985, excuse me. Uh, we don't need experiment anymore. It's all, it's all going to fall, etc., etc. And ever since I've talked to him, I've reminded him of this. <laughs> I couldn't resist. But nevertheless, now in neutrinos, so it's been a long time. Okay, but look at look at the neutrino I leave you, which is my 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 thing. Okay, so first of all, neutrinos. Uh, this may come as a surprise to you, but neutrinos were never really respected very much by experimentalists. Why? Because it was born in the mind of a theorist. Most most particles are born in experiment, evidence in experiment. But the thing that's interesting is that 1930s and the revelation, and 19 56 is a detection. So my roots as a string theorist actually tell me I should really try to write this the intervening years is this way. But then the oscillation is only 1998, where the, 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 the Japanese result together with, 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 with the solar result, which is two squared times 17. Okay? And the last experiment that really should be very interesting someday is it's neutrino less double beta decay. And if I follow the pattern, <laughs> I, I have bad news for you. I go from one, one one to another one, et cetera. So one has to be very, very, very patient in this business. So I have was, a, even worse really... news for you. It's actually 2082. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> so anyway, so I want, I'm talking about all these things. My, my, my feeling is that I was, you know, I was completely lucky and fortunate to have Jeff as a graduate student because the Jeff has, so you know all about Jeff's work, etc., and rightfully so. I did not mention more before, I did not mention mirrors, I did not mention maybe moon, moonshine, etc., and things I don't even know about. Okay? But at the same time, what I like about Jeff is that is this, this humility and no nonsense. The ability to understand theory and at the same time always look for an application of one kind or another, which is why I talked about the HQ paper. 
because it is, it is some, some, and this is very, very, very rare. At the time when now theory, like everything else, is tribal, people do this, do that, do that, etc. Uh, Jeff is still um, one of the persons who basically has a foot on both sides and can actually evaluate this. And, and I, as his advisor, I'm very, very lucky to have, to this day, a student like, like Jeff, and also so proud to have seen him doing so well. So, happy birthday. So much. <laughs>
<laughs> no. I mean, anything having to do with the breaking of symmetries is a mystery to me. Okay? The same way the vacuum is, is a complete mystery. I, I, you, you can model it by, by Landau-Ginsky, you know, type, type stuff. Yes. But I would not all these models you look at have proton decay, don't they? Yeah, it depends. No, well, it depend, depends on the scales that you have. I mean, it's always, it's always a matter of scales, right? Right. I mean, it's not, I mean, I, so for example, in a paper with, with, with Jeff and David, I mean, we worked out the whole, I mean, in those days, we worked out all the way going to, to plug. We found that the model was intermediately asymptotically free, but then once, once those big representation turned on, it was no, no longer asymptotically free. And then we say, inshallah, you know, <laughs> right? But the, but the fact is that uh, we, you know, I mean, this is an incomplete, it's a good question. I think proton decay will be discovered when it is discovered by the Japanese in hyper-K, high hyper-K, maybe, maybe within my lifetime, perhaps. Thank you, John. That's how 10 has 10 for the Higgs, but it has a second Higgs in that 10. Well, we in this paper we use the U1 symmetry. So what does that do? Well, it means that basically we have the ten. The ten is real, so the ten plus i ten prime. This is what we used in 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 that paper. So we did. I think we did have a second Higgs. Yes. I mean, just like people have been using that to explain the uh, elevated W mass. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, I thought I was bad. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I guess there are too many possibilities. You shouldn't look at all data coming from different places, different detectors, and put systematics together. That, that's a dangerous game, but who knows? I don't, some expert, I mean, that's a good question, I just don't know. I look. I'm not a physicist. I'm a pattern person. I recognize patterns, okay? And and all I know is that these these patterns look right. Now, whether or not they have a natural explanation or not, I do not know. But for example, in the anti in the asymmetric mixture, one one thing that is completely remarkable that is the quality of the determinant comes directly by a dimension five plus a dimension six of which is, you know, that talking about effective field theory. Now, whether or not that, that's good or bad, I don't know. And the fact we have TBM. So I think this, this is right, but it may be just right in a sense of what our old paper was. That it's an indication of we should look in that direction, but not, not necessarily taking it all, all that seriously. So, so I, I've been very cavalier with, the, with those two, two questions, of course. Oh, you might have used that explanation. <laughs> no, no. Actually, my question was somewhat related to it is the inverse problem. So you, you can find uh, models or theories that explain the data, but the problem is how do you test if that is the right explanation? There may be multiple explanations to this. Well, let me try. No, that, that is okay. I find something that fits the data, but how do I really check? That this is the right model. Yeah. Usually, that experiment that constant. Well, you, you're not going to check the, whether this is the right model with one experiment for sure. Yeah, which you, experiment? You, you can kill it with one experiment. But yeah. you, you cannot validate with one experiment. Yeah, the question: What validates? I don't know. Right now, so let's say if you look at the sum of the masses, okay, uh, basically it's not very far away from the Planck value. Okay, there's a sum. Of stuff, etc. Well, the next time you have a more accurate stuff, you could you could start. It would be terrible to be unvalidated by cosmology. That would be, <laughs> for for particle physicists, that would, be, that would be a terrible thing. But, you know, uh, yeah, I I do not know. All I know is that this, my point of view, those are directions to go into and look. And you might prove it's not right. And it, I have no problem with that. But this this is what model this is what model building does. Right. But I don't know of one experiment that would well one 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 thing, for example, if if I find that it's not the normal ordering, 
that kills it. I thought you would be happy with proton decay. That well, that, but then if proton decays, I mean, what I will, yeah, I mean, it depends what it decays into, but the hell with it. I mean, if proton, <laughs> if, if, if proton decays, then you go back to something like that and you try to, to see what kind of parameters, what kind of, uh, of symmetry breaking you need to do, what path you need to do, obviously. But from my point of view, the, the thing that is most interesting, right, the mass relation between the, between the B the B quark and the tau yeah. tau, okay, and the renormalization, the value of the renormalization of the quark mass versus the lepton mass over that many stuff gives you roughly a factor of three. Now, might be coincidence, probably is. And I believe that. You know, so we're full of coincidences with very few measurements. I mean, that that challenge. So, I think. I think we should thank Pierre again. Can I sit next to you? No, I'm trying to try it.